Hello everybody, I am so happy to announce that the four season of Inspire Your Essence is over. We made it to a four season and I am so excited to share what every guest had, what inspiration they wanted to share with you. I love all of my guests that have been on. They inspire us, they show us their resilience or the creativity that they have in their life to make the world a better place. And yes, we will be having it this season. So we will continue. And I don't know if you noticed this or not, but during the fourth season, it was Michelle's Inspiration Hour. I decided to go ahead and change it to be more creative. And so that's why I came up with Inspire Your Essence. Because I really feel like everybody's story does that. They inspire our souls because their soul is inspired. So get something to drink, get something to eat, and I hope you enjoy 20 guests that I had on during the fourth season, their inspirations. So I hope that you are inspired. I hope you find your resilience. And I hope you find your creativity by watching each one. All right, until the next season, God bless. Say like the, the vision that compels me in this project is a, a world in which um, everybody has a home where they can really thrive. And it is a place of refuge and uh, consistent ongoing growth as a person meaningful connection with the people that they live with or that they have over. Um, and it sets them up to make their greatest impact in the world around them. Because I think the stuff of grassroots change in the world, it really starts at the home. And uh, me caring about how your home is and inviting you over to mine and taking care of that uh, with one another. So that's a sort of, that's the vision that I stand for is, a world in which uh, everybody has a home that they really love and can thrive in and uh, that we stand for that for other people as well. Number one is to know that you're okay. And you're, you're not just okay. You're, you're an amazing human being. We're all exactly the same value. You're not lesser than. No matter what you've done, no matter what all the stupid, awful, terrible things that you feel bad about, that you have shame about that makes you want to hide, you still, regardless of that, are this amazing equal to me and to, to every other human being. That's who you are. That's number one. And number two, if you just begin to scratch the surface of this idea of personal responsibility, you'll be able to make it through and really progress in life. I see it and I work on it myself every day. And what matters in the moment is just to ask your, ourselves, what can I do about this right now? No metric for it. There's no measure for it as to how grief, you know, takes each person and each person's journey will be different. I'd say find a support system, you know, whether it's therapy, whether it's friends, whether it's one friend or a few friends, whether it's, you know, uh, family, somebody who is there, because some days you just want to be in your PJs and you don't want to see the world, but you just want someone to sit next to you, hold your hand. You don't even need to speak, but you just want someone there. So find that support for yourself when you're ready to start doing some sort of activity. Like I say yoga, you might prefer swimming, you might prefer walking, you might, anything else that you want to do. You want to go to the gym, um, which I do as well. Just some sort of physical activity that moves the body because then it allows the grief to move through your body as well. Um, and it sort of helps you just get a little bit unstuck, if you like. Empathy is one of those strengths that you can tap into when you're operating from your prodigy brain. And so A, you got to figure out how to bridge the gap. How do you even knock on the door of your prodigy brain? You, I would say you're laying in bed and you have a belief, I can't get out of bed or today's not worth getting out of bed. That's keeping you in bed. I would A, tell you to do some deep breathing techniques, do a box breathing technique where you're literally breathing in 
holding it, breathing out, holding it, breathing in, holding it, breathing out, holding it. So do that for two minutes so that you quiet that mind chatter that's going on. That's telling you those saboteur narratives that are telling you it's not worth getting out of bed today, right? You've quieted that down. It is not, can any of us imagine better, but can we do better? The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. And then we shall save our country. Abraham Lincoln. Important thing is that we keep we keep working on ourselves, that we observe ourselves every day, that we observe what emotions we have, we observe the circumstances going on and say, well, what am I feeling about this? What am I, am I reacting or responding? And the more awareness I have, I can respond rather than react. When we react, just like we were talking about in the beginning, we tend to act with judgment and there's separation there. And the, the bottom line is we want to be in a vibration of love. And so the more we can be aware of what I'm, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? And how can I shift this into love? How can I shift this into love? How can I see this circumstance with compassion? How can I see this person with, with appreciation? Every single one of us is spiritually awakened. Just by the, as by the definition of being human, you come spiritually awakened. And if you doubt that for a second, look at a baby's eyes the moment they are born. You can see that depth and that spirituality so much deeper than, you know, you can see it in some monk who's living in the Malaya and has been meditating for 60 years, you know? So we all come with this spiritual awakening and then we kind of condition and train and society gets us to believe we are separate from that. So when, when people come into this process where they are thinking they're going through a spiritual awakening, it's really a spiritual remembrance. And I would tell them, don't think you're going out there to find something which you don't have. Just allow these layers to naturally answer. Number one, gratitude. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of work with, um, with sort of being uh, mindful in the moment. And one of the things that can that can inspire you the most is thinking about gratitude for what you have in your life. And because I think that, you know, we talked before about the, uh, the percentage of story that we're t using or talking or telling in any given day. And I talked about how, you know, if we include the stories that we're telling ourselves, the percentage rises because we're always grinding on information. And there's a tendency to grind or tell, tell ourselves stories on the negative, right? We tend to go toward the negative. So I think if you can, if you can think about the things that you're grateful for, that will override that negativity and give you inspiration for possibilities moving forward. Now, what there's two things that I I really lean in on from a business perspective that I think like may or may not be a bit like untraditional is one, I really listen to my intuition. So when, you know, it's very easy to see all of the Facebook ads and all the people telling you to do all the funnily things and do this and do that and say this on a client call and say that in your proposal or whatever. Like there's a lot of that out there. And it took me a couple of years to realize I just need to like lean in on who I am and show up as Ashton and they're going to get all the value from the service that I provide, but they're also going to get like the Ashton experience. And if I don't lean into my intuition and how I'm going to put things together or how I'm going to talk on a client call and who I'm going to reach out to and what does that all look like, I'm not necessarily going to get the people that are the right fit. 
you have to have that self-awareness to realize that you're having this downward spiral. So this downward spiral to negativity, it's born out of a lot of things. Like your, your teacher, it's just born out of what we heard from our teachers, what we heard from our parents, what we heard from our siblings, our friends. And so that that downward spiral is a loop of all those stories and all that information that we've been gathering, sometimes in my case for decades, right? And we get to a place where we have a choice. I say that over and over again in the book, that, that internal voice, that voice is a choice. And we have a choice to believe that narrative or to change it and spiral back upwards, right? Um, with a positive narrative. So that's what I would advise is that can't change everything at once, but think about the the recording, the the repetitive negative narrative that keeps up, um, appearing, and decide to change it. You know, you know when you think things are happening to you, they're happening for you. When you don't understand, there's some divine plan that's taking you. So if you are in a place where you need inspiration, it's usually because things aren't working out how you want them to, and. I have to say things never work out how I want them to, but that's usually because they work out better than I want them to. There's a different plan. It's always a better plan. And so just having the belief, the faith that this is happening for me, not to me, um, it's going to get you to a place where, uh, you know, you feel inspired and re and curious and ready to see, you know, what's around the next corner. When we're hyper tuned into one thing, we could end up being tuned out to God. So I think that's the first thing is how are we actually working on our ability to actively listen? And then the second piece then is to actually figure out what it is we're listening for, right? A lot of people heard Jesus's voice. Many of them didn't actually hear him, right? They heard words, they heard his intonation, they heard all those things, but they missed his message. That's why he often said, for those with ears to hear, let them hear. That's why he would say parables to hundreds and thousands. And then later on, the disciples would be like, what, what in the world were you talking about? And he'd say, you're, you're, not, you're not hearing me. Let, me. let me spell it out a little more to you. A lot of times when we are trying to hear God, we already have an idea in our head of what we want him to say or what he, we expect him to say. We want him to say the thing that will bring about the things that we want are I guess if you need to be inspired, I would say get quiet, <laughs> get quiet with yourself and ask for inspiration, ask for help, ask for what you need and see what unfolds. If you need a sign, ask for a sign. Um, one of the things that you know I say over and over again is that there's this idea of non-interference and our guides and our angels um, are asked, are waiting for us to ask them for help. And so let them show up for you. See what magic is possible in the world when you ask for help and when you let your guides and your angels show up for you. I was reading um, uh, the, this book on signs uh, by Laurel Ann Jackson. I love her. And she cracked me up. There's this part in her book where she's like, if you only knew how hard they were working to show you these signs and then you don't see them. <laughs> Use gratitude as a personal, like internal weapon against your down thoughts. In our brain, I mean, we've got the chemicals and, and sometimes we're low, tired, exhausted. Gratitude, if you did 30 seconds of thinking about something that you are grateful for, just 30 seconds of it can reset and combat so much of that heaviness within us, that combined with the knowledge that you're a spirit having a human experience, shifting that perspective into being out of being stuck in the human experience, and instead you're a spirit having a human experience. Know the power of your intentions and thoughts and play around with that. See how it affects the balance. It's not gonna solve everything right out of the gate, but it's definitely gonna give you a leg up. Um, no matter what, is that the day that your child died is the day that his legacy, well, for me, is his legacy began, your his, your child's legacy began. The day that it died, that's the day that your child's legacy begins. 
because it's up to us. It's, it's up to us. You know, if you want your child to be remembered, if you want your child to keep being with you moving forward, you have to do it yourself. It's all on us. Like, I, like Caleb and, I, and I'll use me as an example. Like the day that Caleb died, I could have pushed him away and put him in a chest and never talked about him again. But because I kept pushing and I learned how to deal with my child loss, Caleb's, Caleb lives on with people that never met Caleb. You know, um, and obviously the book, you know, with the book and all the people that would have never met Caleb and don't know him except for my stories, they know him now. And that's his legacy. Life is happening for you, not to you. I lived a long time thinking, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. And the reality is, is everything is happening for you. If I look back on my life, every single thing that has happened in my life has brought me to this point and has prepared me for the work that's ahead. And I too am now sitting on top of an amazing facility on Lake Erie that is a vortex and that is a natural healing center. And so bringing women together here with the energy practitioners in my network is really where I'm heading. And I would say that everything way back from even first, second, third grade to now has had a purpose, has had alignment, has taught me something. So as you move through your day, remembering life is happening for you, your job is to be in the moment and to ask yourself, what is the lesson? What am I supposed to learn? What is here for me to absorb? I want to make sure that any woman that is out there who has lost their voice, I want you to get your voice back. If you're a Christian, I want you to pray and ask God to give you your voice back because that is one of the things that the enemy likes to take from us, our voices, because he knows that God has given women wisdom. We are some smart people and God has given us the voice to use because words are so powerful. What's the best way to stop you from being who you are is to take away your voice. So I want you to get your voice back. I want you to start speaking up for yourself again, just like I have to. If I need to take a pause and go to the bathroom and pull it together, pray, ask God to help whoever it is I need to address to receive what I have to say, season my words, help my attitude, help me to forgive them, help me <laughs> to be able to be in a space where I can share with them and never, ever let anyone silence your voice. I would say we have to stop telling ourselves false things. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger is a lie. You've been through worse, you'll get through this too, is a lie. We have to understand where we are in our life. We have to give credit to what we're going through and to what we have already been through. But piling up too many stones will create a mountain eventually you can't climb. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger is a phrase that was coined in the late 1800s by Frederick Nietzsche. Shortly before he died in an insane asylum. It's okay to let that one go. The truth is that the strength was always within us, each and every single one of us individually. The reason we survived was because we had that will to survive. The strength within us should never be credited to our traumas, to our abusers. They don't deserve that kind of credit. We are all love, all of us. And anything that is not of love is not us. And so when we look at our partner, when we look at the people in the world, consider that we are all loving beings. And then there's all this crap on top of it. But at the core of us, to remember that we're all the same. We all bleed, we all hurt, we all love, we all wanna belong, we all wanna feel accepted and appreciated. We're not that different. And when we can remember that and have compassion for each other and the ways that we have learned to survive in this world, even if it's not great, I think we can have more forgiveness and compassion for each other and more connection and joy in life when we can stop making each other wrong. More importantly, stop making ourselves wrong for what for what the, the cards that life has given us, especially. A, a, a new strong version of you, a new relationship, either with the person who hurt you at a very different level or with someone new. Don't stay stuck. And just to close the loop on my story, um, 
rebuilding is always a choice, whether you rebuild yourself, like I said, and move on. That's what I did with my family. Wasn't an option to rebuild with them. Or if the situation lends itself, you're willing, you want to, you rebuild something from the ground up new. And that's what I did with my husband. So not long ago, as two totally transformed people, we married each other again. New rings, new vows, new dress, and our four kids is our bridal party. Um, you know, betrayal will show you who someone truly is uh, and then move along. It also has the opportunity to wake them up to who they temporarily became. You could still move along, but you also have an opportunity for a very different type of relationship when that's the case. 